Morning. How are you all this morning? Good? Really? Good? <laughs> it's good to be here. Um, thank you for uh, inviting uh, me to come and speak, uh, to share the message this morning. My name is uh, Chang Kim, as, as Douglas mentioned. Um, I am of uh, Korean descent, if you didn't get it from the last uh, name. Uh, but people get confused with my first name. They think it's Chinese. So if I go with uh, Chang Kim, I may change that na name to CS Kim or whatever. You could call me whatever you want. Uh, call me that. But I'm married to my wife, Joanne. She's over there in the back. And two uh, wonderful and beautiful kids, Faith and Caleb. They're seven and five. We see that we have a Caleb in here. It would be an honor if, you, if we named it after you, but no. <laughs> we named them after Caleb and the Bible. They are wonderful most of the time, um, but um, they can be a handful at times. Uh, I know that if you're parents, you probably uh, deal with uh, kids, and uh, if they grow up, they fight all the time, and they test your patience. In that, in that sense. But this morning, I want to share with you what uh, it says in Joshua chapter uh, 1, verse 8. But before we do that, now, why don't we pray? Lord, uh, we, I want to come here to, to worship you, uh, to listen to your voice, that it will be able to challenge us, that it will be able to convict us, that it will be able to help us apply in our lives to practice it that we become imitators of you at all times in every facet of our lives and I pray Father that that it is not me that is speaking but it is you that we listen to your voice with an undivided attention so help us um, just to listen to what you have to say to us this morning in your son's name I pray amen this morning I want to speak to you uh, mainly on chapter 1 of verse 8 from the book of Joshua. Please follow along. I know we read this a few minutes ago, but this is what it says. The book, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. The question that I have for all of us this morning is this very simple question. What does it mean to be successful? Especially in the Silicon Valley, what does it mean to be successful? How would we define success? Would it be grades? Would it be money? Would it be material possessions? Would it be certain status? When I was invited to speak, I was debating what to speak on. And as I kept on thinking and praying, it continued to lead me to Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. And it kind of kept me there. And I believe that's what God wants us to really think about, what it really means to have success. And I want to really dive into Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. As you have, read, as you have heard messages in 1 Samuel about Jonathan and Saul, King Saul had it all. Let me read you his description in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 2. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders up upward, he was taller than any of the people. Did we get that part? He was a handsome young man. And he just doesn't really stop there. It goes into more of a description. They go deeper. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. I don't know. My wife is married to me. We've been married for about 11 years. I don't know if she will be able to say, my husband right there, Chang, is the most handsome person in the world. <laughs> really? Because she sees characters in the, on TV and she goes, wow, he's good looking. <laughs> I haven't heard that in a long time from her. <laughs> Which hurts me deeply. <laughs> she has never said what the Bible says about, Sam, about Saul, the most handsome person 
in all of Silicon Valley. She has never said that to me. Maybe she'll say that to me today. But it'll be out of pity and sympathy. And it says here he was taller, a head taller. Imagine that. I'm 5'10". Someone who's about 6'10". 6'8". Very tall man. Handsome, tall, probably strong and big and muscular. He was that warrior, right? And he was wealthy. He had servants. And then he was a king. He had everything, right? If we look from the outer perspective, Saul had it all. He had money. He had power. He had material possessions beyond belief. There was no one more handsome and no one that was taller. And he was fit. What more would you want than what Saul had? Nothing, really. We look at Saul and that's the person that we want to be like or to be. Saul's life from an outer perspective had success. He had it all. Yet, here are words I would never want to hear said of me. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23, it says this, Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Wow. How powerful is that? He had everything the world probably would desire. But yet, God has already rejected him. Saul had everything, but he didn't have God. Therefore, his life was not successful. God had rejected Saul, and from just looking at Saul, many of us would define that as success. Yet everything, and I want us to really understand that part, yet, with, with every, yet everything without God is a failure. Everything we could accomplish, subtracting God out of that equation, is a failure. God desires us to live a life that is prosperous and successful. So how do we live a life that is prosperous and successful? One way is to be obedient to the word, and it comes in chapter 1 of Joshua, verse 8, in the very beginning. Be obedient to the word. It says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. God here is giving Joshua a commandment. It is also a commandment God is giving to us here this morning. We are to be guided by the word of God and God's commandment. So the question is, are we being guided by God's commandment? Are we being guided by God's word? When I first memorized this passage many years ago, probably about 30 years ago, I memorized it from the NIV version. And it says this, Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. How powerful is that? Do not. My kids are laughing. It's okay. See, having kids is this great joy. They give you great joy. They make you laugh. They make you smile. They come and put their cold feet on you when you're sleeping. And they want to warm up. They wake you up at 6 o'clock in the morning. Oh, that's so, so beautiful. Right? And then they hug you and it makes it all worth it. It's a great joy. But there are times when they just drive you crazy. Really, they do. I don't really have a lot of gray hair. But I tell them whatever I have... It's them. It's their fault that I have some gray hair. And I tell them that. But I think I have to say, you have to listen. And I tell them that you always have to listen to mom and dad. Mom and dad knows best. And I tell, when we tell them, do not cross the street by yourselves. My five-year-old, when he was about two or three, he would always try to go across the street. Stop! Do not do that. And like, what did I just do? They're oblivious. But we use a lot of things like, do not cross the street. Do not fight. Do not make such or, or much noise. A lot of do nots, right? And as they're there, I want what's best for them. We want what's best for them as parents. I want them to listen. I want them to be the best kids in the whole world. Probably won't happen but I could pray and I could wish, but I want them to be. 
See, God desires for us to be the best we can. But not in a worldly sense, what the world tells us what the best is, what the success is. I want them to understand that it's not about success in a material sense, but being followers of Christ. To understand at such a young age, I want what's best first to know Christ. That Christ is the Lord of their lives. That Christ died for them. See, God desires us the same way. He wants us to be followers of Christ. And that starts with being obedient to the word. Obedient to the word. For Joshua, now the great commander of Israel, he was to be guided and wholly governed by the book of the law. This book of the law, he had to be guided by that, by governed by it. It wasn't maybe I'll just do it 50% of the time or even 75% of the time. For Joshua, he had to do it wholeheartedly, 100%. He had to be guided by it. It's almost like if you don't know directions, GPS system in your cars or your phone tells you how to go. You follow that to a T. For us in our lifetime, it has to be God who guides us and leads us, listening to his voice and guided by it and following to a T. Early in the chapter in verse 7, God tells Joshua, do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. It means don't get distracted. Be focused on the goal. Be the leader who is obedient to the word and lead the people of Israel into the promised land. Have we ever wondered why horses wear blinders? Yes, horses wear blinders. Have we ever wondered why? Horses have their eyes at the size of their heads, which indicates that they are hunted in nature, similar to rabbits, for example, as opposed to the hunters, as, such as cats. So, so horses have peripheral vision, which means they can't end up running off course unless they are made to remain focused. Blinders are small squares of firm leather that is attached to the bridle at the side of a horse's head. Some say the bl blinders were invented when a preacher had a wager with one of his friends. The preacher bet that his horse could walk up the stairs in his house, which the horse did with no problem at all. But when they tried to coax the horse down again, it wouldn't budge. So the preacher covered the horse's head and let him down. He realized that covering all or part of the horse's vision could encourage the horse to take a chance it would not normally take. I don't think any of us have eyes at the side of our heads, like horses. But we do have peripheral vision. We're able to see to the left and to the right. There's a greater chance we will get distracted the further we get away from the word of God. See, I like the last part of the story about the preacher and the horse. But when he tried to coax the horse down again, it wouldn't budge. So the preacher covered the horse's head and let him down. He realized that covering all a part of his head or horse's vision could encourage the horse to take chances it would not normally take. See, I believe that all of us need spiritual blinders. Really, spiritual blinders where all of our vision is covered and we faithfully trust and be led by God in our obedience. Paul wrote to the people of Ephesus in chapter 2, verse 10. He says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let us faithfully walk in our obedience to God, God's word, for God desires for us to live a life that is prosperous and successful. Second, we are to meditate on the word. Meditate on the word. It comes in the second part of verse 8. It says, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Meditate on it day and night. It says that is something many Christians 
church-going people struggle with, meditating on it. How do we find time in our busy schedule to not just read the Bible, but to pray, but uh, to actually bathe ourselves in the, God, in the Word of God? Back when I was in Bible college, I was taking Greek, and the professor, Dr. Sauer, he was sharing with us, and he was teaching us Greek, but he shared with us how he got into spending time with God. And he said at the age of 16, he made a decision. I will spend time with God five minutes a day. We're like, great, we only need to spend time with God five minutes a day. He's like, he doesn't stop there. He said, five minutes a day, and he goes, I made a promise to God after, five, after three months, I'm going to add another five minutes. And we were calculating, we're like, that's a lot of time. Because at the end of 12 months, he was doing pretty much 20 minutes a day. But when I think about it, 20 minutes a day, it's not really hard. And then by the 13th month, he was doing 25 minutes. And this is when he said he was started when he was 16 years old, and we were thinking, how old is he now? And times it by five times, you know, every three months, or five times four, 12 minutes for, no, 12, 12, no, 20 minutes for every year. And I was like, we're thinking, oh, he reads the Bible a long, long time. He said, well, at some point I needed to stop. I couldn't continue to add. And we're like, so how much do you read? And he astounded us, and he said, well, I read for four hours. Or get into the word for four hours. We're like, really? He goes, yeah. And he said, he does it in Greek. He does it in Hebrew. And just to make sure that he got it correct, he reads it in English. And he was a Bible professor. And we're like, so what time do you guys do you wake up? He says he wakes up at 3 o'clock in the morning. And for high school students, they, that's when they actually sleep. Right? Because they study and they sleep at 3 o'clock and wake up at 6 o'clock. But he wakes up at 3 o'clock to spend time with God. That challenged me to really get into the Word, to meditate on it, and to bathe inside the Scriptures. It was important for Joshua to meditate on the book of the law day and night. It's not really 24 hours a day, and it kind of scares us, but to always have God's word on our minds. Joshua needed to understand the importance of meditating on the book of the law day in and day out to really continue to think about what God what wants for him and how to lead the people of Israel to be obedient, to be faithful. The excuse, the excuse many of us give is that we just don't have time. My day is already full. I have classes, extracurricular activities. I work all day. I have kids. I'm always running errands. I'm always on call, and I barely sleep. It's really not the lack of time, and this is important for us to think, really understand. It's not really the lack of time, but of heart for the things of God. Not really the lack of time, but of heart for the things of God. Joshua, to succeed and to be prosperous, he needed to have a heart for the things of God. He understood what most occupies the heart will engage the mind, for our thoughts always follow our affections. David writes in the book of Psalm, chapter 119, verse 97, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the days. David knew what it meant to live a life that is prosperous and successful. Joshua understood the same. We are all encouraged to do, know it too. So here are a few ways for us to spend time with God. This is something I learned when I was about 20 years old. And there are six things, or seven, because the seven will lead me to my third point. Wait on God in a quiet place. If you, have, if you live in a home and it's really loud, go into your room, go into the closet. Prepare yourself to listen to God's word when it's total silence. Just to listen. 
Start with prayer. Number two, asking God to clear our minds, no distractions. Not about what I'm going to do 30 minutes from now. Not about what I'm going to do five hours from now. But just to clear our minds. Three, read the Bible. And I don't mean just open up the Bible to any passage. Because you may open up to the book of Leviticus and you will be like, what is this? There are a lot of other things I don't understand. Or you may open up to a part where it says all the genealogies. Cool. There are names I cannot ever, under, ever pronounce, but it's in the Bible. It's not about that. And if you don't know what part of the Bible, talk to the pastors and leaders. For those who want to begin, I would say New Testament. I even would say the book of John, the gospel of John. Fourth, meditate on it. It means spending time thinking about what we just read. Are there any convictions? Anything that we noticed that caught our attention? Number five, keep a journal. I know girls love to keep journals. Guys, we don't like keeping journals. Get into the habit of keeping a journal, writing down what we just read, what God was saying to us, to remember what, how God was teaching us and working in our lives. And, and then it helps us to look back about a year from now and say, you know what, this is what I was going through and how God answered everything that what I was going through. And number six, pray and listen. And with how you started, ask God for his help to put that into practice in our lives. And lastly, which is number seven, but yet, lastly, after you have done this, it nicely segues into my third point. We are to be doers of the word. We are to be doers of the word. And it comes in probably the middle of verse eight, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. So that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. I like this commercial. Or I, I like commercials watching and and one of the commercials about Nike and they says at the very end it says just do it right and it was zoomed by so I had to go on the computer and, and and then I had to go on YouTube and try to figure out which commercial it was and I had to play it and type what would everything that they were saying and it was kind of like interesting what the people had to say and it says that whatever you really want you have to set your mind to it you have to be obsessed with it. It's the mental toughness that's going to give you a goal, a national record. I want to play on the world stage where everybody is watching. Big crowds, big stadium. My crazy dream is to play in the NBA to be the greatest of all time. The hardest is when people say I'm too young or I can't do this because you're a girl. Sometimes in mid-training, I'm just dying, I'm tired. And when I think about me standing on that podium, that's what drives me. And then it ends, and it says, just do it. I was like, wow, that's pretty powerful, right? And this is a commercial to encourage people to dream big, to set lofty goals, and to go for it. Don't let anything, anything stop you. Just do it. I wonder how many... How, I wonder how a commercial of believers would look like. Starting Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Josh, Joshua, Elijah, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and everybody else in the scriptures. And instead of saying, just do it, we see a commercial of these patriarchs prophets, kings, and leaders. And it says, just did it. Wow. It would be so powerful, wouldn't it? That we see all these great leaders of what we've been studying, and it says, just did it. That would encourage me. Just to do it. And at the end, just did it. They were careful to do what's written in the book of law, the book of the law, and their lives are characterized as being successful and prosperous. They were doers of the word. 
in college, um, I had one of my friends, he wanted to learn how to play golf. He never played golf in his life. And at, when you're 19, 20 years old, it's kind of too late to really get good, good at golf. But he had this passion to wanting to be good. So he said, you know what, in a few years I'm going to be good. You just watch. I said, I'll watch. He had never played golf. But he said, you know what, I'm going to read on golf. I'm going to read these books. I'm going to, I'm going to learn how to play. I'm going to train everything. And I'm going to just know how to hold the club, how to stand, how to swing, how, which irons to use, and pretty much everything about golf. I'm not a golfer. I don't like holding a club a little white ball, hitting it and chasing it, right? I never got into that. I just, well, first you have to hit it. It might go somewhere else. But I never golfed. And some time had passed, and he asked me, hey, let's go to the range. I was like, hey, let's go. You know, I have used golf clubs that people have given me. I was like, hey, let's go. And he goes, let's go hit some golf clubs. Sure, why not? Let's go. So he picked me up, and in the trunk of his car, he had bought a new set, new set of golf clubs. He never played in his life. He bought a new one. Spoiled little man. We went to the range. He got some balls and went out to hit some. He was bad. Instead of the ball going straight, as it should normally go, it would go to the left or to the right. And I stood in front of him. Instead of me trying to concentrate on that little ball, I'm looking over him, thinking, what if the ball comes to me? <laughs> I never understood the, con the concept where it's probably physics or whatever. You hit the ball thinking you're going to go straight, but it goes to the left or to the right. How does that work anyway? Right? It was pretty bad. And he was perplexed. He says, I know everything about golf. I read books on it. I learned how to hold it. I know the technique. And he was confused. So what did he do? He said, forget all these books. I know everything. I'm going to hire a tutor. And he hired a tutor. And a few years later, he says, let's go. And I, and I said, let's go. Let's go again. I never touched the golf club before, after that, too. But yeah, when I saw him a saw him few years later, he was pretty good. It wasn't going to the left or to the right. It was actually going straight. About 150 to 200 yards. I was like, wow. I never told him that he was good, but I was like, wow, he's pretty good. Right? He went out, and he put in a lot of practice. He had book knowledge, but he put in a lot of practice. And he became a doer of golf. We may have knowledge of the scriptures, but we have to be doers of the word. We have to be doers. We have to be people who practice. As believers, we are to obediently go out and put into practice what we learn, all things we have meditated on. My wife makes fun of me for not being handy. I'm a city boy. I only grew up with sports. I never learned how to make anything or build anything. And she says, I'm not, a, I'm not handy around the house. I, I feel as if she should just say, not handy, but she should say, he's handsome, right? <laughs> not handy, but handsome, right? But she always says, I don't really follow instructions, which is true. I don't follow instructions in assembling things. Yeah, it's true. All I do is just put the tools and parts, screws, washers, and all the things I laid on the side, you know, in the middle of our living room. And I put the picture of what I want to assemble. And I start guessing what I want to, what I want to assemble. I don't, I don't really like really going through the instructional book. Okay? And why? <laughs> That's my preference. I just don't. I, and I, I look at the picture. This part part goes here, these screws, these washers. And then when I'm done, I tell her, success. And then she says, why, how come there are more screws and washers on the side? Ah, they're, they're extra. They're being generous to us. Right? They're giving it to us so that we'll be able to use it in the future. 
her assembling of certain things. So for my birthday, she bought me a, a grill. And guess who put it together? <laughs> Not me. <laughs> my wife did. She put it together. And, she, and then I noticed something. There was one washer and one screw. And she used the same excuse. <laughs> they just gave it to us for extra. I was like, really? But I think many of us are like that with the word of God. We pick and choose what we like to do. We just pick and choose. And then we only do what benefits us at that particular moment. The Bible is very clear. It says, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. It's not just little parts of the scriptures, but all that is written in it. During the assembling, or even after the assembling, you know, she will always make fun of me, so I tell her, you know what, you do it all on your own from, now, from this point forward. In conclusion, back when I was 20 years old, I had the privilege of going to Ecuador for two months. There I learned the great stories about these five missionaries, Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, Ed McCauley, Pete Fleming, Roger Uderian, who gave their lives to share the gospel to the Huaroni warriors. They were martyred January 8, 1956. And these are some of the quotes of these great five young men. Nate Saint, people who do not know the Lord ask why in the world we waste our lives as missionaries. They forget that they too are expending their lives and when the bubble has burst, they will have nothing to, of eternal significance to show for the years they have wasted. And Macaulay, I have one desire now to live a life of, of reckless abandon for the Lord, putting all my energy and strength into it. We've already put our trust in him for salvation, so why not do it as far as our, our life is concerned? Roger Udarian, he says, I must read the Bible to know God's will. At every point, I will obey and do and die to self. I will be, be alive with, unto God, that I may learn to love him with all my heart, mind, soul, and body. Pete Fleming, I will gladly give my life for that tribe, if only to see an assembly of those proud, clever, smart people gathering around a table to honor the sun. Gladly, 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 what more could be given to a life? Jim Elliot, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he to gain that which he cannot lose. Wherever you are, be all there. Those who had killed the missionaries on that faithful day, January 8, 1956, came to know Christ through Jim Elliot's widow, Elizabeth Saint, and Nate Saint's sister, Rachel Saint. One of the killers, Kikita, who came to know Christ, repeatedly asserted that he, all he wants to do is to go to heaven and live peacefully with the five men who came to tell him about Wagoni, creator God. These five men, life was full of life and success. They were prosperous. They gave up everything for God. They gave up everything for savages. But yet through their life, these savages came to know Christ. How incredible is that? When we are obedient, we meditate, we become doers, and we faithfully follow God, and other people are impacted from our lives, and they come to know Christ, and they will celebrate, and they will sing praises and honor to God Almighty for all eternity. See, may we become obedient to the word, meditate on the word, be doers of the word, that we live a life that is prosperous and successful. Let us pray. Lord, you are good all the time. You are faithful all the time. Even to Joshua, you said, repeatedly to be strong 
and be courageous that you will never leave him, that he shall be obedient to the word of him, that he shall meditate on it day and night, that he shall be able to do all things from the book of law and be a doer of it. I pray, Father, that we will be able to be obedient, meditate, and be a doer of the scriptures, of the word of God. Not about, not to be concerned about the successes, what the life says, or the world says what the success is, but according to what you say what success is. Help us to be people that are impactful, that make changes a difference. In your son's name we pray, amen.